Welcome to episode of My Next Move. This week is very, very unique conversation because we dive deep into the arts of what PR can do for your company. Whether you're a business owner, a manager in the hospitality space, wherever you are, PR is almost like the glue when it comes to digital media marketing. Everybody knows what marketing is, but not a lot of people understand the power and beauty of PR and how it can make your business way more successful. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming in an award-winning publicist, Alex Hurley. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you have had one of the craziest pasts that I've witnessed over the last three, four years since mm-hmm. I've known you. Yeah. Living in Vegas, award-winning publicist. You are all over the all over the map right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited to have you on today to talk a little bit more about PR because recently I've been doing a lot more research on it. Yeah. It's, you know, owning a marketing agency, starting my own personal brand, and there is so much to know that blows my mind and how it tailors into all things business. Yeah, a thousand percent. And um, before we get into all that, I kind of want to learn a little bit about you just so the people listening kind of understand your background, where you came from, because your story is really inspiring. So I would love to hear a little bit more where you started, where you came from, because you're also from a small town, correct? Correct. Yeah. So I am from Huntington, West Virginia, which is a really small town down on the border of Ohio and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I'm a first gen college student. Both of my parents were self-made and just kind of climbed the corporate ladder to get to where they're at. Um, so yeah, I, it's really crazy from where I came from to now, like you said, I'm in Vegas, but, Mm -hmm. um, at an early age, I always kind of knew that I wanted to get out and to do something and to see the world. I just didn't really foresee becoming a publicist. Um, but yeah, so I went to college and actually started at WVU and um, was in the comms program, and I was like, okay, I guess I could be a journalist, but I didn't want to be a journalist. And I started learning more about PR, and I was like, well, this is cool because mm-hmm. PR is really on this flip side of journalism. So yeah. whenever you're a journalist, you're the person on the camera getting the news out, but when you're a publicist, you're the one feeding them the, the news and the story ideas. And I really like that side of it. Mm-hmm. So um, I actually transferred to University of Kentucky for a PR program because West Virginia didn't have one. Okay. So yeah, then I went to University of Kentucky where I got my degree in public relations and that's kind of how this all started. How it all got started. So yeah. how was like so how was the transition from WVU to Kentucky? Was it a much better program? How was it? Yeah, so well first of all, the culture of UK versus WVU was like so crazy <laughs> for me. West Virginia was more chill and relaxed and What? Really? Yeah. Well, I mean in like uh for example, like at football games you're in shorts and t shirts. At Kentucky yeah. you were in heels, hats and like dresses, oh, SEC, man, okay. very southern. So I think that the culture itself was a little crazy when I first got to Kentucky, but um, mm. the program though was was really amazing, and that's whenever I learned more about PR and how strategic it is, and really the full scope of public relations. Yeah. I really didn't know much until then. Mm. Um, I knew the publicists were were the ones, you know, coordinating the interviews, behind the scenes doing things, but I didn't understand the strategy of PR and its velocity and how important it was until I got to that program mm-hmm. and. It was so extensive um, and, and amazing that it really t- it really helped me get to where I'm at now, for yeah. sure. It's crazy. It's crazy because, like, when I first heard about PR, I never really thought how valuable it could be until, you know, you start your own businesses. I'm very similar to you coming from yeah. a small town. I don't mm-hmm. understand the industry. But I also feel like a lot of people that own businesses or corporations don't understand the value of it either. So when we had that very long conversation, what was that, like, three, four weeks ago now? Mm-hmm. It's really crazy just to, like... Well, the amount of knowledge you have is very, like, it's crazy to me. It's, like, really, really inspiring to how much you've absorbed over time. And I'm sure that comes with experience with being in Vegas and working with some big-tier, you know, companies. You're here in Tampa now working with Hyatt, right? Hyatt? Um, Hotel Hyatt, yeah, and Ebor. So it's a new boutique hotel. Um, Ebor, in general, is, like, one of the oldest parts of Tampa. Yeah. And it's very up-and-coming. The image of, of, of Ebor itself is not amazing. So that's yeah. one thing we're working on right now. And with Hotel Haya, it's the new boutique hotel. We're really working on its brand positioning in Tampa, mm-hmm. making it a destination, making people want to come to it. So that's one feat that I that you know we're going to be working on with with that. Mm-hmm. Um, Ebor doesn't have an amazing reputation. Yeah. So when you open a shiny new beautiful boutique <laughs> resort in the middle of that, yeah. you have to try to negate um, and reshape and shift 
that with your brand uh -huh. to make people want to come. So yeah. that's one thing that we're uh, that I'm going to be working on really heavily in the Tampa market. Yeah, that's really in the cool. coming months. But so how would you how do you do that as like a, as a PR publicist or yeah. is that is it kind of just like okay, we have this really nice new building. We know there's homeless people outside, but come on anyway, because we have all these amenities. But, yeah. I, but I do know that Ebor has like this like massive multi-million dollar project where they're trying to build it yes. up. So they're like the first people there. A thousand percent. So yeah. Ebor in general, um, a lot of people in the city are doing a lot of amazing things right now to really work on that image. Yeah. But specific to Haya, so anytime you are brought on with a client and there's an issue that's mm -hmm. an outside issue, you immediately have to come up with ways and positioning and factors publicly to mitigate it. So for example, mm -hmm. um, one thing that we're gonna be doing with Haya is really publicizing and positioning them as a must experience destination in Ebor yeah. and positioning Ebor and the history of, um, for, for example, it's for the first people that came to Florida from Cuba, mm -hmm. a lot of people think it's Miami. It, it's not. It's Ebor. Yeah. So wow. I didn't public know that. right. So publicizing the history, uh -huh. publicizing the story with PR. It's all about the narrative. It's all about the story and and your experience. Yeah. So making people want to go to Ebor. So talk. So you know, really making sure that we're getting Hotel Haya in Cigar Aficionados magazine, yeah. talking about the Cuban history, the new boutique luxury experience, but also, um, yeah, paying homage to, to Ebor itself. I yeah. mean, there's tons of like Cuban cigar making, um, places there. There's tons of stuff to do. So it's focusing on the positive publicly. So you can kind of negate and bury everything else, the, the, the negative reputation. Interesting. Yeah. Cause you kind of sold me on it right there. Like I kind of have to check this out based off like the facts that you know. So you kind of have to know your history and the yes. information on everything. Yeah. So. You right. I mean, and, um, with PR in general, you know, it's the first thing that I do, whether I'm like consulting or with a new account or client is yeah. I find out the brand, the history, the goals, where you want to be the evolution. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, what the goals are. Yeah. So, PR um, is really similar to marketing, which we've talked about this a lot. You're a digital marketing expert. I'm a mm -hmm. public relations expert. And what we are now seeing um, on the day-to-day -day is how congruent they really are. I mean, yeah. with influencer marketing, which can be considered digital and PR, because mm -hmm. as a publicist, we have to make sure that the influencer is on par with the brand image. Yeah. And we have to make sure that what they're saying and experiencing and publicizing mm -hmm. to their target audience is on par with what we want our public um, image to be. Yeah. Where the digital side is, okay, what are their analytics? Who is this reaching? Who are their demos? And that's really how you come together and you have a powerhouse. And it's yeah. really crucial. I mean, I think it's essential these days. You have to have both to mm -hmm. amplify each other. Yeah, it kind of, it sounds like to me the PR is almost like, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's kind of like the glue of mm -hmm. the digital media marketing funnel. Because yeah. you have to utilize like every piece, whether it's the, ad metrics or you need influencer marketing yeah. like you're saying email marketing what are you really promoting out there and like what's the story behind it so yeah. it's really it's really i mean it's still tying together to me i'm still learning the process so it's great to hear this story but is there anybody that you like to focus on is there a certain niche that you like more than others or is it kind of just like who comes you know first come first serve type of thing with the company you're with yeah so um the company that i'm with now we focus on um hospitality food and beverage and tourism so okay. For example, we represent destinations, which is mm. pretty crazy. So um, we represent Navarre Beach, Florida, okay. which is on the Panhandle. Um, it's right on the Gulf, actually, Pensacola, Destin area, mm -hmm. Eureka Springs, Arkansas. So, and with destinations, it's really crazy because um, you're publicizing to the world why people should want to come see you when they mm. go literally anywhere else. Yeah. So you have to be really strategic, and that's all about knowing your partners, knowing the experiences there knowing who your target audience is through that digital sector yeah. so you can hyper target. So for example, um, spring break just came and gone. And uh, for example, with how we would work with digital marketing to get our messaging out there, mm -hmm. we work really closely with analytics and with data to see where these people are coming from. Okay. So with Florida, a lot of people, um, it's a drive-in market. A lot of people dry compared to flying. Mm -hmm. It's Texas, it's the Midwest, it's the Carolinas. Um, so from a PR perspective, I'm like, okay, so I get this data and I know that if our demo is 35 to 55 in Houston or in Chicago, that I need to be pitching our experience 
to those publications in those markets. Wow. And our digital team knows now that they need to be hyper-targeting our ad buys mm -hmm. to those people and those demos in those markets. And you just have a solid campaign that's cycling and, funnel and funneling your tourism messaging across the board. Yeah. And messaging is really the key with PR. Um, it's crucial as a publicist and as a digital marketer that you are, when you're targeting with the message, it's the right one. Yeah. If it's an eco sustainability message that you're making sure that you have that sustainable language mm -hmm. in your ad and that you're then getting that ad to the right people. And as a publicist, making sure that when I'm getting these CEOs and in interviews or if I'm pitching the destination to these um, eco-friendly writers that I'm constantly drilling that messaging in. Yeah. So public perception becomes the brand goal and the brand image of that sustainability. Mm -hmm. And whether you're in hospitality or entertainment, um, the main premise of PR, because it's very ambiguous, there's a lot of different functions of PR, but yeah. in terms of managing reputations, it's crucial that you are hyper-targeted, hyper-strategic, and that mm -hmm. you're consistent. A lot of people don't give PR um, as much time because it can be harder to track compared to digital marketing. Yeah. With digital marketing, you can immediately see the click through, who's mm -hmm. gone, who's looking. With PR, we don't always know who's going to read the article yeah. that I got you in Forbes, even though we know it can have a 200,000 uh, per month circulation. Yeah. We don't know if it's going to convert and we don't know who's reading. Yeah, that's so it can, you can't always track it the same. Um, but in terms of reputation, I mean, Buffett said it best, it takes 20 years to build a reputation, five seconds to destroy it. And it's mm -hmm. really hard to repair. So, yeah. um, a lot of people, I don't think understand, um, how PR can really help them long-term uh -huh. specifically if you're in a crisis, if you, and this has been proven through tons of research, if you're a company that has gone through extreme crisis but you already have a public positive image through PR, mm -hmm. you're twice as more likely to bounce back quicker from the crisis. Yeah. And that's another thing too. Crisis management, crisis control, I have a lot of experience with that in Vegas. Um, and PR is just plays a huge hand in that company bouncing back. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of ironic to say that five seconds to destroy it because PR, you're almost like, like you said, an Ebor, you're burying the fact that there's some like bad mm -hmm. things to it, but only glorifying that the good, th the good sides of it. So, right. That's interesting. So what's the what's the process like? Because there's a lot of moving parts, it sounds like, because you're, you're talking about the analytics and all like the yes. measurable aspects of it, yeah. right? So like, what is your, I don't want to say day to day, but like something that helps you, because are, are, you're not technically writing the articles, right? Or are you like matchmaking like so, journalists? Yeah. So actually, I'm glad that you asked because a lot of people have no idea as yeah. a publicist how the back end works. So yeah. pretty much... Um, Let's say you're opening a new restaurant mm -hmm. and you want to get the news out about the restaurant opening, then I would develop a press release. I would write that and that would include the menu, um, quotes from the chef, maybe just depending what it is for the opening. Mm -hmm. Then we would, we would create a hyper targeted media list and you can create these media lists through platforms like Muckrack or Cision where you find okay. this database. So that way you can get um, your press release to the, the food and beverage journalists that would cover your opening mm -hmm. in your niche. And then and then it becomes a niche. There's some food and beverage writers that maybe they only talk about um, or they love Italian, uh, Italian restaurants or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Then that's another segment. So it has to be hyper-targeted. So we would then create the media list of who is relevant, who who would be relevant to receive this information. Okay. And once we develop the press release, we would send that out. And then mm -hmm. from there you have um you have your media preview events, you have your influencer dinners mm -hmm. to build the anticipation to get people in the door. Because that's the key to um with if you're launching something with public relations, uh specifically if you need to have a conversion. And by that I mean you need to sell tickets. Uh, whether it's concert, you need seats and you need to get uh, butts and seats, yeah. whatever it is, you really need to build, utilize PR to build anticipation. So on opening day, you have a line out the door, you have the right target audience in there. Yeah. And PR allows you to be strategic with that. So mm -hmm. um, initially, yeah. So we would develop the press materials or the pitches and we write those ourselves. And then we would send that to the hyper-targeted list of people that would cover it. Because for example, um, you would never send a press release about a restaurant opening to a meteorologist that covers the weather. Yeah. Some people think that media is media, mm -hmm. so you can send it to whomever you want, but it's wrong and it hurts your coverage because if you're sending someone something that 
doesn't even write about what you're writing about, leaves a bad taste in their mouth. Yeah. And media relations plays a crucial role in the success of public relations. You want to make sure that you're building the right relations with the right niche of media for your client. Mm -hmm. So that way they're getting consistent coverage. You're, you can go to them when you need an article and vice versa, and you're really giving them a good experience. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it sounds like a rigorous process. This is like a long term it's very, situation. Yeah, and it's very strategic. So, yeah. um, and one thing too that we didn't touch on, but just to really round this out because PR really is so ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing that we do with, with getting a new client, um, depending, some people, they just want you to get them through an opening. And yeah. that would be a, a pretty much, you know, we get their brand deck, we develop the materials, we send out the invites, we do the media drops, we're doing everything we need to be doing um, mm. in terms of opening day, and then we're done. Yeah. But, but most people, which I recommend, consistent PR. So um, once we get through the opening, now we're continuing that, that brand messaging. Because if you want to develop a brand, it has to be consistent. Yeah. Just with, with digital marketing, you know, it for best results, you need to keep it pushing. So with PR, mm -hmm. we would develop strategic year-long or quarterly PR plans Damn, okay. that are that are that are of um, topic to what your goals are. And everyone's mm -hmm. goals are different. You know, if you're a restaurant um, that specializes in Italian cuisine, then we're going to make sure that we have na all of the national. Um, Italian food days on the calendar and we'll be pitching you for me for media and studios mm -hmm. to do like a cooking show okay. um, Or if you have a really cool um, owner, yeah. that's like a first-generational um, American from another country that we want to make sure that we're pitching them to talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion in their space for yeah. interviews and um, it gets really oh, Okay, it, it, so you're kind of like putting them on um, I want to say on. It's yeah. like very like, yeah. you know what I mean? You're like almost like helping them yeah. boost their like invites almost. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we're really, we're publicizing them and their image. And, and our job is to spread awareness to the right people yeah. um, in a way that's one, going to help your end goal. Yeah. So for, you know, even um, like, let's say that you were opening a restaurant and you were mm. like, okay, I want by the end of six months to have a 25% increase in, um, in reservations, yeah. how can we do that? Then I would come to you with my team and we'd say, mm -hmm. hey, uh, we need to get you in business journals to talk about your what you're doing as a businessman so people can see the guy behind the brand, mm -hmm. which is good for your brand and it's good for you because now you're becoming a community member. Mm -hmm. Or maybe uh, you wanna be more involved in the community, then we would come up with corporate social responsibility ideas, yeah. um, which will help your reputation and your company's reputation and, and it'll help you with press because media are more likely to cover someone that isn't inherently newsworthy if they're giving uh, back to the, to the community or doing good. Yeah. So maybe you want to partner with a local nonprofit and say, hey, for um, the month of October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I want to give 30% of all of our earnings to the local um, cancer rehab facility in Tampa. Mm -hmm. Then we could do a press release and promote it. And then at the end of the month, we can have a check um, presentation media event yeah. where you would give the check to um, to whoever the res the receiver would be from the cancer facility, and it helps your reputation because now you're giving back to the community, yeah. and now pe your name is consistently being out there on behalf of yeah. your brand. Um, and then, of course, too, it's just making sure that you're in all the roundups, Thrillist, Eater, yeah. um, making sure you're in the right publication so people know to come and see you. Mm -hmm. It's really just making sure that you have a publicist that is plugging your brand in the proper mediums. Yeah. You know, like if you're a restaurant, you have to be in the eaters and the thrillists um, versus, you know, if you're a bank, we're obviously going to be pitching you to more Different. trade, commercial, yeah. right, avenues versus the fund, the Forbes, right. So it's kind of like you have to, I mean, obviously you've built up this knowledge and network of people that you have to plug them into almost like putting the right piece of the puzzle in the mm -hmm. right spot if you will right That's yeah kinda, absolutely okay interesting so what's like the difference between so let's say any like small brand like a big yeah. thing nowadays is like coaching online coaching or like personal brands mm -hmm. or marketing groups everybody's a digital media marketing guru it seems like nowadays so right. if somebody wants to like build buzz so let's say for example I'll just I'll just use an example what I have going on yeah. so I'm about to release a digital product mm -hmm. so to Take that digital product. What is the difference? Like, what is the key difference of me running ads, building hype on my social channels, and all that type of thing? All that type of stuff, I yeah. guess. 
compared to PR? Because it kind of seems similar, but I know that there's two lanes. Can you kind of describe that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's earned media versus owned media. Okay. So PR is inherently earned. While there is crossover with mm -hmm. paid sometimes, um, the difference would be, you know, having someone that's constantly coming up with ideas with pitches, yeah. pitch strategy to get you earned press. So mm -hmm. whether that's broadcast or print or even radio interviews versus um, where you're you're paying to do digital ads, you're paying to do digital marketing. Yeah. Um, that's the main difference on paper between PR and, and marketing is one is earned media, mm. one is owned media, and typically more on the paid side. Um, but I will say, I mean, in terms of in terms of the things that are similar, I mean, these days the lines are getting really blurred, and we kind of touched mm. on this earlier. It's really important that you utilize both. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you, if I'm out here getting you on the news, talking about your coaching and what you're doing, mm -hmm. but then you're not on the back end, hyper targeting your audience through yeah. digital platforms, then you're not going to be as, um, you're not going to be as targeted and structured and structured as you could be. Because of course, through digital analytics, yeah. you can see who's clicking on your website, that demographic, the audiences. And then through PR, I'm amplifying that on a larger scale, mm -hmm. but the conversion isn't the same. I mean, well, one, you can't track the conversion with broadcast interviews. Yeah. Um, you know, you're casting a net mm -hmm. and it's good to, to be out there and to be known, but digital, um, you, you can track a mm -hmm. little more thoroughly. Um, the return on the investment is a little more clear with For PR. Sure. We can provide you analytics. Yeah. We can tell you what the ad value would be, what the circulation is, mm -hmm. but it's not as targeted. We can't provide you a report with who clicked on the article, yeah. who clicked on your website from the article mm -hmm. versus whenever someone comes straight to your social channel and you've served them an ad, you know exactly where they're coming from. Yeah. You can kind of, I feel like, I feel like that's right. Yeah. But yeah. there's, I feel like there's ways through different softwares that I've that I've seen mm -hmm. over time that I use and whether it's stock trading, my marketing company, whatever it is, um, you can see web traffic views or like yeah. people do your web traffic. Absolutely. So I feel like when you release something like that, you could see an uptick. Maybe it'd be a little bit more measurable with like the web traffic increase. Well, and that's how we justify it to clients, right? Okay. So um, for example, if we do a big national launch or announcement mm -hmm. and we have a media report that has a $20 million and I'm just yeah, of course. <laughs> has a $20 million ad value that's been picked up on every market across the country with a $3.2 billion circulation value. Mm -hmm. We know that that is, that realistically, that that's the value of what we have just done. Yeah. And we can, we can certainly assume that if your web traffic has gone up or your social media has gone up and that was the only difference, mm -hmm. we can allot it to that okay. in our efforts. Um, but it's just, you know, some clients that are very into numbers, they want the specifics, they want to know, the, they want to know the demographics and that's where it gets a little, um, on the day to day, it can be tricky to mm -hmm. consistently really justify from a number perspective on, especially whenever digital can be so specific. I mean, if someone clicks on a Facebook ad, you know, you can go down to like where they are, their interests, yeah. their likes. And with PR, it, it just doesn't work the same. Um, but it is still equally as valuable, and sure. I think that that is what most people really don't understand. Uh, yeah, I think that I think you're hitting on a lot of topics that I kind of struggle with sometimes when I'm promoting my SEO services for yes. my marketing yeah. agency. So it's not as measurable, but it really does tie a huge knot into the whole digital funnel. The people can't. Right. I feel like business owners or marketing managers or whatever it is who we're pitching to or trying to offer services. If they don't have that exact value where the ROI is, they feel like they're not getting the value. When right. realistically, when you're building out your SEO and you're popping up on Google Hire by being in Forbes or CNN mm -hmm. or whatever, that mm -hmm. plays such a huge role. It's just like yeah. building a business, building out, you know, I don't even know, like working out even like yeah. if you're you have to yeah. build out a structure, like yeah. a frame in order to yes. scale. So mm -hmm. it really has like opened my eyes, even in the conversations that we had that I really need to focus on not just external and helping clients build out their PR, but personally as well, because it helps amplify your credibility, your SEO, you pop high, pop up higher. Right. You know, if I get involved mm -hmm. in the community, everything that you're yeah. hitting on is like really helping me out. So this conversation is really like, I don't want to say it's for personal benefits, but you know, it's helping quite a bit. I appreciate all the knowledge that you have yeah. on, the, on the industry, but I want to talk a little bit about your experience, right? Yeah. So you live in Vegas, mm -hmm. in Florida now, you're working with a Florida company. It's like yeah. a 
I don't know if you want to talk about that, but you're in Vegas. I know you've had some pretty wild experiences. Can you touch on any of those? Is there anything like some, what's like the wildest experience you've had or who you've worked with? I know you can't probably say names. Yeah. But. So, um, for discre- for NDA and discretion C, um, which a, a big part of PR too is like lock and key, the amount mm. of information that we're trusted with. Um, so yeah, the not so, su- the not so fun side of PR. Mm-hmm. And like I kind of said earlier, PR can be kind of an ambiguous term because it can be internal communications, external comps, yeah. crisis management, public affairs even. So um, just just to kind of like hone in on um, crisis comms for a second. Mm-hmm. So Las Vegas is 24-7. Yeah. I mean, the casinos never stop. It never ends. It's um, chaos out there. It, it is chaos. <laughs> and um, you have a lot of tourists. You have a lot of drunk people. You uh-huh. have a lot of celebrities. You have a lot of CEOs. Um, I mean, it's Sin City, so, yeah. and it really does live up to the name. There's a lot of crazy things that happen. Um, it's hard to be specific on the amount of things that I've seen and dealt with you, like, wouldn't believe, but uh, one thing that was personally pretty crazy for me, I mean, I'm from a small town. Of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, Vegas was a complete culture talk to me. One of the craziest things, like, professionally and personally, I think, about Las Vegas um, is the amount of homicides that take place in these resorts that you the literally never hear about or know about. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty alarming. And if you'll notice any new resort opening in Las Vegas, do not have balconies. Uh-huh. I, I don't know if you, if you've you been yeah. yeah. have balconies because so many people jump off of them. They're thrown off of them. Damn. Um, And actually, so, but a personal experience, and then I'll tell you something crazy that happened not that long ago. Trigger warning. Mm -hmm. I'll just go ahead and throw this in there. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I, when I was representing hotels and working with casinos, I mean, the amount of overdoses, murder, suicides, um, people killing themselves even too, just because they've lost everything. There's a lot of loss that happens in Vegas. People come there and literally lose everything. Yeah. Um, People also come there too for the wrong reasons and things happen. But these poor, like, there's like maids that literally make like barely minimum wage. And they walk in and they see these horrible things. They find these people all the time. Yeah. And, but Vegas is one of the biggest tourism cities around. So if the public knew... What goes on? Some of these casinos, what goes on behind the scenes and what you have to, but yeah, I mean, there's, there were situations where, um, actually I can tell this story and feel fine. Okay. Um, so yeah, the homicides dealt with that all the time. I okay. mean, just making Damn. sure that making sure to, cause number one, I mean, the first thing that happens in this situation is my God, the person that found these people, um, whether it was accidental or not, I mean, it's yeah. pretty traumatizing for your staff. So making sure they're Okay. Um, but then controlling the narrative. If you have other, there's thousands of rooms in these casinos. People are walking by, wouldn't know what's going on. That causes yeah. chatter. That causes the press to come. Mm-hmm. So you have to mitigate that immediately. So, I mean, it's a really quick turn and burn. If there's something going on in these rooms, you have to, first of all, handle your internal structure of crisis communications. Usually yeah. that involves, um, if in this situation, I mean, you obviously have to get the police involved immediately. They come up, but it's all very... Very hush hush because Damn, they don't want yeah. to draw attention to it because it's really bad for business. It's yeah. bad for publicity and you don't want people wow. digging around. So That's crazy. I dealt with a lot of yeah, a lot of that stuff. Um, so you just bury it, right? You like is it like you create headlines or you create like So the so the thing about PR is you always wanna be um Damn. you always wanna be proactive <laughs> instead of reactive. Yeah. So one thing too, like internal crisis comms is huge for companies, whether you're a Pepsi or um, you're a, a, an MGM in Las Vegas, you have to have an internal structure yeah. because most of the time, crisis can be mitigated if there's a plan put in place ahead of time. Okay. So for example, if they're- <laughs> so you're planning for homicides? Yeah, well, right, you're planning <laughs> for whether there's a shooting that happens yeah. on property or, um, or death or something happens to your CEO, having a plan in place that you know who to call. So wow. even for example, um, and, and this can help you just really quickly because I do think this is important. Mm-hmm. Let's say that um, you open a huge shop in town or, or a venue mm-hmm. and there's a shooting that's uh, happening. Yeah. What, what's the first thing you're going to do if there's a shooting? You need it. You have to have a plan, an, an internal crisis plan, which in PR, we create those for our clients all the time, yeah. which is, okay, this is the CEO that you call. This is the head of security. This is the exit strategy to get out. This mm-hmm. is who you call from PR to notify the press. 
This is the head of security to make sure people are exiting properly. And then even having pre-written statements. Oh, wow. Use this template. So you I kind have, of have like risk management to the job too. Risk management is a huge part of okay. PR, especially when you're working in Vegas or in New York City yeah. or in Miami or in LA. It's 24-7. Um, wow. With PR, you can't control people. You can't control things, but you can control the narrative. Yeah. If you have a plan in place. That's interesting. And that's the key. Crisis management you, is the key with, cri with crisis communications is that depending the level, right? There's levels to this. Of course, if there's a huge oil spill and like you're like Exxon, yeah. there's not much a PR team can do besides try to repair yeah, of course. the reputation. But in a situation like this where there's no immediate threat, mm -hmm. someone was found, passed away in a room, yeah. you have an internal structure. And then the goal is that people follow that internal structure so there's no external interference. And they'll just call you and be like, hey, Alex, we got, another, so we know, got another one. Yeah, just so you know, wow. this happened. Um, PD is here. We're working on it. We, we're, um, you know, the coroner's here. It's an investigation. Wow. And then from there, you know, usually, but these things happen so frequently, it's like nothing. I mean, really? yes, uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. And that's why a lot of the, um, the hotels no longer even have their towers open that can afford to do so. Yeah. Some of these casinos, I mean, there's nothing they can do and they just mm. mitigate it the best way they can. But and you will not see a brand new resort um, with thousands and thousands of balconies like you used to 20 years ago. And it's because of a lot of uh, these instances. Like um, building infrastructure differently now? Yeah. Okay. Um, but That's like one, wild. It, 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 you know, and I think too, um, but it's just being prepared, right? And yeah. with PR, um, you're always going to have CEOs that say things they shouldn't. And then as a publicist, you have to fix it. Yeah. How are you going to publicly fix this image? You come up with mortification strategies. Mm. You're scapegoating so you can blame it on someone else. There's denial. Mm. You just lie. Which, by oh, the way, man. as a publicist, I transparency with the public, you have to be transparent. Yeah. It's the quickest way to strengthen your relationship. Because if you keep lying publicly, then yeah. it's not a good look. And actually, in terms of like relevancy, um, one of the, the most immediate things that I've seen happen with a PR crisis is the NFL. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. whenever, um, whenever the Bills player like almost passed away on camera. Yeah. What was his name? The player? DeMar Hamlin. DeMar Ham yes. So he passed out in front of, on live television in front of everyone. No one knew. Yeah. Well, it came out and there were, there were, whether your pro-vax or anti-vax is irrelevant, uh, yeah, I'm just yeah, going to yeah. speak specifically from a public was, relations perspective. I was everywhere. People were talking and they were like, oh my God, what happened here? And whenever he came out of the hospital, they wanted him to do a press conference and the NFL was refusing. And the NFL was getting so much heat for not allowing him to do a press conference. When in reality, I'm sitting here like, well, okay, so what's the NFL's options here? Um, they put this man who was just literally traumatized and almost passed away was in a coma yeah. to get crucified on the stake by press because they're going to ask those questions. They're going to say, hey, did you receive the vaccine? Yeah. And there's no good situation for the NFL because if he says yes, they can turn it. he received the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Then the pe then the part of the media, because the media at a high level, mm -hmm. at an international national level, there's always sides. Of course. So if he says yes, he received the vaccine, they're going to say, oh, well, did your doctor attribute your heart condition as a possible side effect of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. If he says no, he looks like a liar. If he says yes, the NFL, even though a lot of people in the country uh, are requiring vaccines, now the NFL is like, oh, so now it's the NFL's fault that he almost died in front of millions of people in America watching him on TV. And then it puts him in a bad spot. Of course. So, and then if he says no, he didn't take the vaccine, well, then it's like, okay, well, how come the NFL is refusing to comment? So mm -hmm. either way, sometimes you get yourself in those situations too. And you, and, and you have to decide, is it better to not speak at all yeah, or, or to take the risk? And I'm going to assume as a publicist with a lot of experience that he probably did receive the vaccine. And that's why the NFL didn't want to put him in that situation because yeah. they didn't, they didn't want them to turn this, I mean, it's a miracle he was alive and came out of the coma, and they were yeah. they were politicking the situation. Of course. So that was a huge instance. I mean, you know, in that situation, it's a good thing the NFL, I think, mm -hmm. didn't comment. Um, because either way, they were going to, and now, you know, the Super Bowl came and went, people have forgotten. Yeah. Um, That's so crazy. But, you know, but everything is so, has to be so curated when you're at that level, specifically with PR. I mean, it takes one thing to destroy your image, and... Um, in Las Vegas, my God, the shooting in 2017 destroyed MGM. Yeah. Their stocks plummeted yeah. because of the shooting. Mm. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that MGM also owned the grounds 
of the festival where the shooting took place. Mm -hmm. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, so they were hit. So they owned it, uh, Mandalay Bay, which was the shooter, and they owned the festival grounds. And they their stocks plummeted, and they're still recovering. recovering their image from that. And the thing is, it wasn't their fault. Mm -hmm. They didn't shoot anyone. They didn't kill anyone. Yeah. But it happened out of their hotel and resort and on their festival grounds. And they were sued, and they lost, I mean, multi-millions of dollars yeah. from having to pay to pay victims in that situation there's nothing you can do besides um besides be reactive yeah. there's nothing they could have done to have prevented that from happening and and that is i mean when you have stakeholders involved yeah it's a whole another level of pr and actually one thing that i really commend mgm for doing was when this happened they were being a great resource for people that were calling they updated their corporate websites for hotlines so people could call try to find their family see what was going on and since yeah. then They've implemented a lot of corporate social responsibility plans, mm -hmm. which is great for repairing reputations. Yeah. Um, and CSR, just for listeners that don't really know, these are just plans that um, that involve you in the community somehow or stability or eco, any initiative you're working on that's doing good, yeah. whether it's nonprofit or for the environment. Um that's also really beneficial and helpful if you're repairing a reputation. Mm -hmm. So one thing that MGM did was they um, enforced a new green deal where they were making a lot of green changes across the board. Because yeah. MGM's international. Yeah. They own... Huge. They own, you know, tons of resorts. And it just so happened that their one location in Vegas has happened from. But they still own 11 other resorts on the Strip. Mm -hmm. So that's as crazy. a company, they took a huge hit and it wasn't their fault. They mm -hmm. had to be reactive to a crisis... Um, that was external. Yeah. It wasn't internal. It wasn't like their CEO did this. A, a guest Damn. did this out of their window. So, yeah, they're still working on their reputation, but they yeah. had stakeholders involved. And, um, so one thing I really commend MGM for doing is, is, uh, you know, over communicating what they could and then incorporating all of this sustainability PR comms mm -hmm. has been helpful for the reputation, especially for stakeholders. Companies want to invest in other, um, or people want to invest in companies that they believe in. They, yeah, they find to be eco um, sound and, and ethical. So that was one thing they did that I think probably has helped their mm -hmm. case. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. It's like, yeah. it's crazy. It's because there's so many different avenues you can go with in PR and just to hit on MGM real quick, they kind of, Bad timing on their part because even COVID three years later just knocked them right back down for whatever they were probably scaling back their, for their credibility. Thousand percent, thousand percent. That's nuts. So what about so what is the lifestyle like in Vegas now that you're in the hospitality industry? It's like you're you're working with all these PR teams. That's where like the hub is, right? Like it's where all the resorts, that's where all the yes. the bars, the restaurants. It's a huge tourist attraction. So what is that like? Is it stressful? High stress? Is it fun? Is it the party so, lifestyle? Like so I feel like I personally thrive in chaos. Okay. And I feel like a lot of publicists, unless are doing internal comms like you have to because mm -hmm. uh it's so especially when you're in a big city oh my yeah. god like vegas la new york city uh miami it's 24 7 that you're constantly on the go so mm -hmm. um the environment's pretty las vegas is a lot of fun there's always something to do there's yeah. always something going on um but from a pr perspective um it, it's a lot of fun vegas is growing like crazy too mm -hmm. i mean now that we have the raiders the knights um, there's rumblings of an NBA team coming through, um, really? which I'm sure, yeah, which I'm sure will be happening. Um, there's a lot of growth in Las Vegas, and we really have been bouncing back from the pandemic. A lot of big cities were hit, obviously. Yeah, you were in New York, I know, so it was that really was awesome. devastating. And in Las Vegas, there's nothing there besides the Strip for tourists. Mm -hmm. So it was just a year of nothing, and a lot of resorts, um, a lot of people lost their jobs. It was a really stressful yeah. time. So we really all were just doing the best that we could. Um, yeah, how did you do, how did you, how was your like whole situation for that? I forgot about so, that. So um, I opened a resort in the middle of the pandemic, wow, okay. which was really stressful. So yeah. um, Circa Resort and Casino, I was with for almost three years. They own the downtown Las Vegas Event Center and they throw a lot of Live Nation and Insomniac events, mm -hmm. a lot of corporate events. Um, they own the D, the Golden Gate and Circa Sports, which is now a huge national yeah. um, sports betting wow. company. But Circa was the first resort ground up in over 40 years in downtown Las Vegas. And, of course... Is that the one with the massive TV? Ma Stadium Swim. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. It, it, you opened that? I did. What? Yeah, yeah. That's so crazy. I was the, on the internal PR team. Yeah. Um, and it was crazy because, of course, whenever... Even a year out. So we opened in October of 2020. Yeah. So we never could have foreseen any of this happening. And from a PR perspective, too, it's crazy because we were like, oh, my God. How do we open this multi 
billion dollar resort yeah. during a pandemic um, and publicize it without looking tone deaf. I mean, yeah. this was in the early point and period of the pandemic. We were less than a year out before the pandemic even started. Yeah. So we had a year to open during the pandemic where mm. people weren't traveling, people yeah. lost their jobs, but we still had to open the resort. We had with construction, yeah. um, you have investors you have to pay back. you got to get your doors oh, yeah, open. Yeah. And we also were dealing with state regulation and city regulation that was changing daily yeah. based off of um, yeah, based stressful. off of everything that was happening. And um, while still trying to build a brand, yeah. because not only were we building Circus brand, but we were building the Circus Sports brand. We were building the Stadium Swim brand. We mm. were building all the restaurants that we were going to be opening in Circus brand while still trying to keep our other brands alive. Mm-hmm during the pandemic and it was a really stressful time. Anyone in the PR and marketing world specifically during this time can can attest to how crazy it was because we we had never been in a global pandemic, I mean, before, especially yeah, dealing with PR. So we were we were given the task of okay, we need to spread national awareness for this new resort, first one in 40 years, mm-hmm. but people are dying and how do we do it? Mm-hmm. And um one thing that we really focused on was how the pendulum was swinging in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. And we focused on the hiring efforts. A lot of people in Vegas lost their jobs, yeah. um, you know, which was so important. I mean, thousands of thousands of people had to leave the city because resorts were closed. I yeah. mean, they couldn't afford to pay the staff. So yeah. one strategy that we really utilized, um, besides still having to go out with, we still had to do our room and suites, uh, you know, national pitching, our food and beverage, national pitching, our sports book national pitching but one thing that we did to help our image so we didn't seem so hey look at our new resort people are dying yeah um was we really focused on the good that we were bringing to the community so oh, that's a nice during a there. time where people were losing their jobs we were hiring thousands of people wow to open our resort and we were doing it and we were in a really um safe way we were following all measures that we had to mm-hmm. um we were making everyone comfortable i mean we actually even held a drive through hiring event which was picked <laughs> up nationally by politico where uh we set up shop right across the street which is really crazy so yeah. we also owned the first ever hotel that was built that's 117 years old wow. the golden gate which was right across from our newest resort circa so that was a cool juxtaposition there um, but yeah, uh, my boss at the time, um, he was like, you know, what if we did a drive through hiring event to keep it outdoors That's because we were dealing with the regulations where if you were indoors, you had to be six feet apart and we were hiring thousands of people. Yeah. So we were like, we can't, we don't have the space. Where would we even do this? Mm-hmm. Um, that people are comfortable with open air masks. So we held the first drive through hiring event in That's the cool. city. So people, yeah, right, it, it, um, because Circa still wasn't complete yet. We were yeah. still doing construction. So yeah. they pulled up ballet, and we had all of our HR team on-the-spot interviews. That's crazy. And if you made it, you went across the street, did a, did a drug <laughs> test, and you were hired. I wow. mean, it was that that high level. So That's cool. So from a PR perspective, we were focusing on the good we were doing. Instead of yeah. highlighting, oh, my God, well, we have to have – we're about to open our doors in a pandemic. No one's yeah. traveling. This isn't a good look. We were highlighting, no, actually – we're bringing a lot of jobs to the community when they For need sure. it. Las Vegas relies on tourism yeah. solely. And people that had worked on the Strip for 50, 60 years lost their jobs overnight. That's um, crazy. So I focused, and our team focused, from a PR perspective with media on the good that we were doing and yeah. how the pendulum was swinging. You really have to be creative in this space because there's you so many be. different... You know what I mean? You like have to be, that situation. Yeah, you have to be creative and you have to be a problem solver. Like an entrepreneur almost. Mm-hmm. Like building your own, I don't want to say brand, but like yeah. situation, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Wow. That's crazy. That's insane. So it's like, it's literally like an entrepreneur space. Really, PR is everything because you have the digital yeah. marketing side, you have the business building side, the relationship side, the financial metric side that you have to keep in mind. There's so much that goes into that. You ever think about starting your own business before? So, uh, yes, I have thought about eventually opening my own, um, PR agency and, you know, one day who knows I might, I feel like for me, um, I love PR. It's my passion. And when you become an agency owner, specifically with PR, it eventually becomes more about the business and less about the PR. So if I could find a perfect world Mm -hmm. where it would allow me to still do create these crisis, like management plans and create these PR plans and to do the red carpet events that I love so much yeah. and also be um, an owner 
that would be amazing. Yeah. But it's really hard when you're at a CEO level of your own agency mm -hmm. to focus on the PR. It becomes more about the business side. Yeah. Which don't get me wrong. I'm all about my bit about business and, mm -hmm. and making money, but my passion really is public relations. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've, with my experience in agencies and with owners and seeing how it kind of works at a high level, yeah. they're very far removed from that side and they're more on the client services side. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know if that's what I want to do necessarily, mm -hmm. but I've thought about it. I've considered it. I think, um, I think I would have a lot of clientele if I Yeah, for sure. So. I was going to say you've definitely built up a good brand for yourself. Yeah. So you could like kind of, I don't want to say steal them, but. Bring them on well, over I think like that there's opportunity, out. right? Um, yeah. Because with PR and, and I mean, you you literally own your own digital marketing firm. You also have to make sure that you're doing your own personal PR. Of course, like that you're in the community, you're part of your um, uh, you're part of your organizations that yeah. you know you're doing things like this where you're speaking and you're educating people that aren't as familiar with the industry. And mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I try to do a good job at that. And yeah. with and and also too, I mean, I'm like the friendliest person ever. You could. You could message me on Instagram like, hey, I don't know what PR is. I'm a new business owner. I, could you give me a basic – and I, and I will. I yeah. always will because I, I genuinely love what I do. I love PR. Um, Sounds I, like a coaching career is coming pretty soon. Um, I do a lot. <laughs> I do quite a bit of consulting, yeah. um, to be to be frank, and, and advising on people. Because some yeah. people, too, they think they need PR. And what they really need is they don't even have a brand yet. Yeah. So I'm like, wait a second. You need a website first. Mm -hmm. You need a logo. You need a brand guide. You need to come up with um, what your goals are. What's your vision? Yeah. And some people, you know, they need to do that first. Some people have that, but they don't have the marketing and the PR, and that's what they need help with. Or some people, they have a dream and a vision, yeah. but they don't know how to get there. Of course. So I'm really good. Um, I'm really, I shouldn't say I'm really good, but I excel at helping people understand where they're at in their journey with mm -hmm. PR um, and what they need to do to get to get there to to achieve their result. I'm a yeah. I'm a I'm a big picture person, um, so I'm all about the tactics and the goals and and what you should do to get there. And I'm always like honest about that. And some people too. I mean, it it, it comes down to um, lack of a lack of resources, lack of time, yeah, lack of staffing. I mean, if you're a one man band, it can be really hard to focus on your PR when you're just trying to keep your business running of course. and I'll always be transparent with those situations. Too. Yeah. Laying that structure. Like we talked about, it's yeah. really important. So it's cool. It's like, cause you have like the marketing knowledge and the PR knowledge. So it's like a really powerful amount of knowledge to give to someone. So yeah. definitely a good person to know and get in contact with on that front. And I feel like if you started that coaching or entrepreneur spice, you would crush it. But, um, all right. So I want to talk about two things real quick before we wrap up yeah, here. Of course. Give me, one, I want to know the craziest experience. I don't know if you can tell me names. Just the craziest experience, not homicides, like that you got to witness. Was it like a pool party? Was it the Circa opening? Was it, what was like the craziest Vegas experience? It doesn't even have to be Vegas. Maybe Miami. I know you've done a lot of traveling to Tampa, Houston. Give me one of the craziest ones. Um, I think that the craziest thing that I've, that I've ever dealt with mm -hmm. was, and I, I can't say, I'm not going to say the resort. Uh -huh. Um, but I will say, well, there's a few, but I think that one of the craziest situations that I've ever dealt with, um, there was this woman mm -hmm. that was kicked out of our resort, a resort, I won't say which, mm -hmm. um, and escorted out by security. Mm -hmm. She somehow ended up in our in the garage area, and the garage, which unbeknownst to me and a lot of people in the company, um, <laughs> acted as the power structure okay. for the hotel. And she was naked, had green hair, broke into the garage power structure. Uh -huh. There's actually articles about this. So you'll be able to figure out the resort if you look this up. Okay. Um, but anyways, she broke into the power structure and literally caused a full shutdown. And there was media at the time on the rooftop. I'm going to be so obvious by the saying this, but there's a rooftop of this resort. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge, like, media, like, national media were up there at the time. And this lady caused a power outage. People were stuck at the pool. They were stuck at the rooftop. Uh -huh. And we were notified of this happening from the news because the security team didn't think to notify the internal team that this naked, green-haired lady that went rogue 
in the electricity powerhouse room caused a full, I mean, and it was hours. People yeah. were stuck on the rooftop for hours from this wow. naked lady. We have no idea how she broke in, how she got the structure. I found out from Fox 5 in Las Vegas calling me, hey, we see this mugshot of this lady that was arrested from your property from oh, wow. breaking into that. So that was probably the know. craziest because I was like, well, first of all, you never want to find out about a crisis at your resort from the news. Yeah. The goal is, you know, first to mitigate for or sure. to come up with a story for the news. Wait, how are they stuck on the roof? Was it just no... Because the power. Down? Yeah, because it was a rooftop. No um, stairs, no, no way to get down other than an elevator. Not unless you're going down 70 foot. I mean, oh 70 my foot. gosh. So people were stuck up from the power outage <laughs> and, and we didn't understand what was happening with yeah. power outage and it was from this green haired lady. Yeah. So that was probably the craziest just around the board because I'm like, because there's so many levels to it. I was yeah. like, wait, why is the local news station calling and asking for a... Who is this naked haired green lady that was arrested from our resort? Yeah. <laughs> how was she in how did she even get into the room because the garage was located across the street so yeah. how did she get Understand. naked <laughs> she was naked the, after she was na they found her naked okay. in the room something crazy in the happen. facility and why was no one notified internally about this and we have and you have national media stuck on the rooftop of it yeah so that was probably the craziest yeah it's um, probably a lot to handle. That was the craziest because I I was like, how is this even? There's so many levels. Yeah. And I it, it's a nightmare. As a publicist, you never want to find these things out from later on. Situation. So give me something like a really good experience that you had, like personally, like one of the most fun times, not even related to work. So actually, you saying that just sparked a memory. So my birthday last August, my mm. 26th birthday, I was in the DJ booth with Diplo oh. at Encore Beach Club with all of my friends. Diplo's awesome. Yeah, Diplo. Oh, well, He's in New York all the time. Well, what's crazy is I literally was on his Instagram story. Yeah. Oh, I saw like, you I post that. I have a screenshot. It yeah. was like a highlight of my life. And those are things that you just can't do anywhere else. I yeah. mean, in Tampa, like you got to pay 20 bucks to go to water to yeah. see like a half no offense to water, but yeah. to see like a random DJ. And in Vegas, I get to do this stuff for free. And it's all so, these big names. And yeah. that's because of your connections too, right? It is, right. It's from my connections, from yeah. PR, um, from, right, exactly. Yeah. From the being in the PR space and the marketing space that's and so cool. Vegas. But yeah, so I, we, on my 26th birthday, we were in the DJ booth with Diplo mm -hmm. and he was super cool. And like we were doing shots with Diplo. Um, I think that just Vegas in general is a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. whether it's Diplo or the chain smokers, um, Dylan Francis, they're all really cool, but the fact that you get to just, like, be in their space with them, and it's just so normal and yeah. chill, that's always been, like, one of my favorite things about Vegas is, For sure. um, and of course, I'm a girl, so yeah, I do easy. understand it's it's different, but uh -huh. it's amazing, and those are experiences that I wouldn't have gotten if I wasn't in the PR space in of Vegas, course. so... I'm really grateful for that, but um, just the nightlife is crazy in Vegas, and all of the celebrity red carpet events, and um, working with Live Nation, I mean... At, at the event center, DLVC was amazing. And I got to meet so many different cool people. Yeah. Um, got to meet Santana. He did wow. a show. Yeah. Which what an icon. He literally played at Woodstock. Yeah. That's crazy. So when I think of, um, of like fun and of my highlights, like I'm thinking about, so some of it is work related. Like, I mean, this is crazy. Just like hearing the names that you've been able to just like be that close yeah. and work with. So, yeah. which is nuts. But, um, one thing. Okay. So one last thing real quick. I know we're coming up on time, but give me yeah. a scale of one to 10. How important PR is, whether you're a small firm, large corporation, just like an overall scale, how important it is to incorporate into your business, whether you're a manager yep. helping out like a, I don't know, marketing team or just a CEO building out a brand. Honestly, it's, um, it's a 10. You, PR is absolutely crucial. Um, and then just to really like round this all out, I mean, when you're building a brand, um, whether you're a small local, um, like individual or business, or you're at a national scale. And mm -hmm. of course, if you're at an international or national scale, PR is even more important because um, that's what makes all the difference and why you drink Pepsi or Coke sometimes if you think they taste the same. It can be that you really love the advertising Coke is doing or you really love, um, like most people when they think of Coke, they think of that kind of polar bear. That's yeah. for marketing and PR. Of course. Or if you think of Tesla, you think of eco-friendly, sustainable, that's for marketing and PR. Mm. So um, it's crucial to have PR um, to amplify your brand, especially at its infancy, because that is what you're going to be known for. Mm -hmm. So it's crucial that you have a solid PR and marketing team to where, you know, 
PR is developing the messaging to make sure that your reputation and the positioning and the story is there. Mm -hmm. And you're using digital marketing efforts to amplify it, to get it to your right target audience. Mm -hmm. And um, it's crucial. And I don't think you should have one without, without the other. I think they're both equally as important. And together you have, I mean, a fully loaded gun of yeah. success waiting for you. If yeah. you do it combined, it's getting to you in front of, of your audience and positioning you in a light that's going to be helpful for your business or for your personality or for whatever your goal is. Yeah, that's powerful. That's crazy. It's crazy how it's all connected. And I'm in the I'm in the space now where it's starting to scale. So yeah. being introduced to you and all the knowledge you have has been, you know, a pleasure. And I really appreciate your time coming on today. But I think that it's time for you to tell us what your next move is. So everything that you've done up to this point, small town girl, moving out to Vegas, mm -hmm. now you have an immense amount of knowledge. I feel like I could sit here and talk about this with you all day long. Mm -hmm. And maybe at some point we'll be able to work together at some point. I feel like yeah. the marketing side, the PR side, there's a lot of dynamic duo powerhouses there. So, Absolutely. Um, but since you've had this crazy experience from small town to Vegas, tell us what your what your next move is. We've talked about your entrepreneurship skills, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe leading into something that. What's your next move to continue the success that you've had? Yeah, so I'm currently a director of PR, um, which is crazy because some days I'm like, wow, what am I, what is this life? Um, mm -hmm. But I think that for me, long term, I mean, I love a fast paced environment. I'm always on the go and I thrive in chaos as a part of why I love PR. So I do think that for me, I see myself um, in the next 10 years, I see myself as a VP, um, maybe an owner mm -hmm. of my own wow. agency. So we'll, we'll see. We're still figuring that side out. Um, but I see myself in a really large PR role and just, I mean, running, just running shit. Crushing just, it. I mean, just crushing it. Yeah. yeah. I just, I love, I love what I do. And um, considering, you know, I'm 20, I'm almost 27 and, mm -hmm. So by 37, God knows oh, yeah. what I'm going to be doing. Um, but I, I want to take over. I just want to, I see myself just continuing to grow and to learn and um, to really develop my, not only my PR, but like my leadership skills. Yeah. I want to, I want to grow other publicists to, to get to my level. And, and I want to grow, I want to keep, I want to keep growing. I think yeah. that sometimes in your career, um, you can, you can become complacent because you're so busy. And it's really, and for me, like, I'm always keeping myself updated on PR, I'm always learning. I'm always keeping up in the digital marketing space yeah. to really have a better understanding of, um, of, of the ever-changing landscape of our industry. And I really see myself just continuing to evolve and mm -hmm. um, continuing to grow. And I, yeah, I just, I think I'm going to, I want to be a powerhouse and I want to yeah. continue to evolve and learn. I think, well, I think you're on the right path. And I think I can tell, <laughs> just like everybody else can around you, I've met thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, it feels like at this point. There's not many people like you with the passion, the drive. And if you have that, you're going to be successful no matter what. So I'm excited to see your story unfold. And I'm very happy we got to connect. And like I said, I cannot wait to see what you do in the next 10 years because maybe we'll be doing podcasts on yachts or something crazy at that point. That, would be, that would be amazing, especially if it's one of our own yachts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties <laughs> we've had along the way. Oh, but. it's okay. It was great um, chatting with you offline about some of our personal interests. And yeah. I suspect we will be working together and collaborating a lot. That's great so. to hear. Well, hey, Alex Hurley, thank you so much for coming on.